Welcome to the first edition of Tijada, our new series focused on the forces that shape the economies um, of the region and of the globe. We are excited so much um, to welcome our first guest, our illustrious guest, Dr. Farouk Albaz, is a recently retired research professor and director of the Center for Remote Sensing at Boston University. He participated in NASA's Apollo program from 1967 to 72 as the Secretary of Lunar Landing Site Selection and Chairman of Astronaut Training in Visual Observations and Photography. During 1973 to 82, he established and directed the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies at the Air and Space Museum of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. In 1982, he became the Vice President for Science and Technology at iTech Optical Systems before joining Boston University in 1986. He pioneered the application of space photography to the study of arid lands, particularly to groundwater exploration in deserts of Egypt, Oman, Sudan, and the UAE. He's received numerous honors, including NASA's Apollo Achievement Award, the Nevada Medal, and the Egyptian Order of Merit First Class. He's a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society London and the Geological Society of America. The latter has established the Farouk Al-Baz Desert Research Award in his honor, and its International Selection awarded him the Distinguished Career Award. Dr. Al-Baz, welcome to Afikra. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Let's start, um, I guess, with something that I didn't mention. Um, you grew up in Egypt. Um, yes. I'd love to understand what sort of education you remember getting um, as a child, and how did that education prepare you or you know, fail to prepare you, maybe, um, for the, um, the career that you've had? It's an excellent question because now the education is very different in Egypt. And in my day, we went to uh, the primary school. We would go to the hallway in the middle of the schoolyard and we stand there and then we salute the, 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 salute the flag and then sing for Egypt and for to keep it a, a great country. So there was something to love the place and to... Uh, encourage all the relationship between the, a person and his land. And then we, our, our, our teachers were all very good. They, we never had this uh, uh, business of uh, special courses and outside of the school and so on. But the teachers were very good and took care of us, really encouraged us a lot. So that my education, I think, was, was excellent. And then my upbringing at home <clears throat> excuse me, was also <clears throat> excuse me, was also encouraged by my father, who was a teacher of uh, is Islam in the Azhar University, teacher of Arab, uh, Arabic language and mathematics. So he kind of instilled in us the uh, values of being decent and of being helpful to others, and also for teaching others. My father used to say, uh, Man Meaning, the, uh, those who know should teach others or else there is no benefit to their knowledge. So he encouraged us to acquire knowledge and encouraged us to convey that knowledge to others. I wonder, this is sort of skipping ahead, but maybe there's a good place to start. Um, you know, the education system in the region, uh, right now there's a little bit of a crisis, maybe a, a, a big crisis. When do you think, um, or how how did the uh, education system, uh, we can focus on Egypt if you'd like, how did it uh, sort of take a wrong turn? By having people that know nothing about education run the place. And for instance, I remember that uh, when I, after I graduated, I was a, uh, appointed by Asyut University as a as teacher helper, the demonstrator, Murid, in the geology department there. And this was very close to the beginning of the revolution in Egypt, 19, the revolution was 1956, and I graduated from college in 1958, and meaning just two years after my graduation, by, uh, by, after the revolution, and then I was there at the university teaching or helping as a, as, a, uh, as a lab technician, kind of. 
and uh, or it was called demonstrator. So we helped in the uh, cl classrooms the afternoon. And the minister of higher education came to visit. And the minister of higher education was named Kamal al-Din Hussein, an army officer who never really went into college. He never entered a university in his life. He was taught in the army college. And he would come and ask questions. But you see that all of the professors and the president of the university and so on walk behind, after him, behind him. And he stops, they all stop, they move. Them. It was a terrible sight for me that here is a guy who knows nothing about university education. Ta, ta, ta. He is being uh, highly respected and highly feared and so on by great professors uh, of, of the day. So it was, it, it is, I really think it is a be the beginning was like that. Yeah. People that had very little knowledge of education and the role of higher education took control of countries in Egypt, in Syria, and Libya, all of that, that, that resulted in a, in a demolition of the view of education and a thinning of the value of education. Yeah, we'll come back to this more uh, for sure later on. Um, I'd want, can you tell me how a geologist from Egypt gets a job at NASA? What's the story and, there? Right, how did you get a finding any job anywhere and then applying to 120 potential jobs that were geology, geology uh, in, in mines and in all kinds of places, all the universities I knew, all the, the colleges I knew, and all of the, the uh, companies that uh, do uh, mining. And while I was doing these applications with my wife, I, I, I get the places and I find, get the fill in pay, papers, and then my wife would type the letter. And I was one day looking at one of the magazines that I get, it was called Physics Today. In one half of one page, I saw an ad that said, at NASA headquarters, they're looking for geologists to work on the geology of the moon. So I said, well, why not? So <laughs> I wrote a letter and I gave it to my wife to type. It was late in the evening, it was like 11 p.m. We had two daughters and she had been working with the kids all day long and she was tired and she said, and what is this for? I said, what for people that would work on the geology of the moon? And she looked at me and he said, and what do you know about the moon? I said, nothing, but I can learn. Just type the one more letter. She typed it while she was mad and she made three mistakes. I corrected them, but I, I sent that letter over and that was the first letter that I got a, or, or, came from them to say, come to Washington to see, we will interview you. That was that was the beginning. I thought she was going to say, Shu, you can't get a job on Earth. You have to get a job on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but there is, I, I'm trying to tease out a story that I think I heard correctly, that there is some sort of diplomatic element to why they may have been interested in bringing you on board. Is that right? No. Nope. No, not no. from the beginning, not from the beginning. Using my connections and using my ability and so on, yes, plenty, later. But after I proved myself in the job and after I proved myself that I can be a useful entity in this field, but so, not at the beginning, yeah. So tell me about what that must have felt like. One, because, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist. When I think of sort of NASA, I think of astrologists, you know, astronomers, astro uh, astronomers, excuse me. Um, and fo folks who think about space, I don't think of geologists. I also don't think of Egyptian Americans. So That's what was it? it, what was it like to be working as an Egyptian American in the sixties and seventies, yeah. um, at a point where diplomatic ties between Egypt and the States are not exactly, uh, peachy. Um, what was it like being, um, you know, in your position with your perspective in those rooms? Yes, this was 19, I joined in 1967 in March. And remember, in June 1967 is when Nasser initiated the war in Sinai and then lost the whole uh, 
the whole thing in, 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 in a few days. And then there, so there was a, a, a great big loss of, uh, of uh, uh, between the, the Egypt and Israel and as, well as, as between Egypt and the West and all of that. And, and even at that time in the 1967, my oldest brother was an arm, arm, army officer in Egypt and he was taken over as, an, uh, uh, as the highest uh, officer rank in the Egyptian group that was that was taken as in in a uh, in Israel. So uh, there were all kinds of things happening at the time that spoke against my being <laughs> able to do anything in NASA or anything in the sciences in America, because America would would had no relationship with Egypt at all. Egypt started the 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 war of 1967 uh, israeli uh, activities were 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 monumental in the us and so there was no potential for anybody of my ilk to have to go anywhere and i knew it and i knew that i should i should be i should make myself absolutely essential to the job for any one of them to look at me half kindly I didn't think yeah. that they will that will ele elevate me or something, but I thought I should work my ass off to make absolutely certain that I am most, I am the most effective person in the things that they want to do, or else they will not attack, look at me at all. And therefore, for, I did. For for somebody who like me who doesn't know much about um, geology, um, can you help explain to me and to our listeners? Um, how your training as a geologist was so essential to their their mission, um, and how it intersects. Training, how the training as a scientist, I think, would be best. Okay, so tell me as about that. Because as a geologist came in, <coughs> excuse me, as a geologist came in very late, but as a scientist, <coughs> meaning you think, you see what is the problem, and what, how can we resolve this problem, and how do we talk about it, and how do we inform others so that they can benefit from the knowledge of science. That's what's the beginning, because geology didn't come until you really were in the within the program and talking about this, the special sites and what would they do and the rocks and that sites versus versus the rocks of the other side and so on, which came like three years later. So at the beginning, it was as a scientist, as an individual who looks at everything that they want to do and the things that we want to do very well, like the, we're going to plan for us, for us to take pictures, we should, we should let them understand what they are looking at and how they can take pictures and explain to them why, what do we want to do with the pictures. All of that was really in, in science in general. It didn't come to real uh, geology until we came into the selection of landing sites and the training of the astronauts to take pictures by themselves from the spacecraft of, of the surface of the moon. And when I had you, to go along yeah. and, and with the, all of this step by step to learn what, what am I going to tell them and how. When did you get uh, develop a sort of specialty in sensing and photography um, more broadly? And when did that sort of specialty emerge for you? In the, in the early phases, there was very little. And all kinds of geologists were doing all kinds of things, and there were there was actually sixty five geologists already working with NASA from nineteen sixty two. That's several years before I before I arrived, like, like five years before I actually arrived. NASA had paid the Geological Survey to get to get a, a whole bunch of geologists to work on lunar geology and the impact craters and their shape and where they are and all of this kind of thing. So I knew. I had to catch up to be uh, to, to be uh, one of them, and so I I did look at I, I, the first thing they did when I arrived at NASA is to say where are the pictures of the moon that they took them before Apollo, and they found them and they found there were there were two thousand two hundred pictures of images of four by four uh, yeah twenty four inches by twelve inches so very large prints like this, and I thought okay. My first job is to look at these things and, and see uh, what is in these things exactly. So I sat for three and a half months. I go to work at 8 a.m. and I leave my office at 6, looking at these pictures and making summaries of each and every one. I look at the picture and write the name and, and then summarize what I see in it and, and put it 
And then <clears throat> after I finished, I said, okay, now where would we go so that we will feel that we could sampled all the kinds of features on the surface of the moon. So I look at the features in my in my notes and then do this. If I found out that there is actually 16 places on the near side of the moon that the side that we see, if we go to all of them, we can we would have sampled all the different kinds of rocks on the moon. Because geologically, if the features are different, maybe, maybe the composition of the rocks is different. And therefore, if we want to make sure that we sampled all the different kinds of the moon, here are 16 sites that we should visit them all. And I made that presentation to my fellow geologists. And from there on, I became the source. So I worked for three and a half months by myself, educating yeah. myself. And then I became the person that they would call me and say, you said such and such and such. What was that based on? I get to my, my notes and I tell whoever, ge what geologist is talking, I, I tell him the story of what he wants. And there, and step by step, I became the source. Can you, as somebody who grew up in sort of the computer age, how did you categorize these 2,200 photos? I mean, all you... by hand, all in little pieces of paper. I had three by five cards, white wire cards and, and little canisters and little cans. And all by looking at the pictures myself like this, pick a picture and, and look at it myself and then make a summary of it on a three by five card. So that, that we had no computers. All of this stuff developed after. Yeah. So at, at the beginning, we had none of this. The, 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 the computer in your hands now is more effective than the, a computer that was in the Apollo machine itself. Are you sometimes amazed when you think back to that? That truth that you just said, that yeah. the computer that's on Apollo itself is less was less powerful than the than any uh, of the little things that uh, you had. Actually, yeah, a hundred dollar phone that you can is buy. less powerful than this. So and the computation ability of this. <laughs> so are you are you amazed when you, are you amazed that 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 this even was possible? Like, do you think back to <laughs> these the Apollo missions thing like? That's impossible. There's no way we pulled that off. That is right. How do we actually figure out exactly where the, the, the spacecraft was flying? We couldn't. Yeah. We didn't have enough to, uh, uh, radio stuff to actually figure out where the spacecraft is moving all around the moon, even before it landed. So where were we? Uh, so we had the astronauts actually look on the ground and see landforms and say, when you see the landform through the telescope, he's looking like this as he's moving over. And so he would say, mark on a specific landform. So we would know, aha, uh -huh. so the spirit that is right over that spot. So it was, it was all kinds of things that we didn't have at all. Amazing. And it, is, it certainly is amazing that all of that was done. But in, in the meantime, all of this was, was being, uh, was happening. And we all knew that all of this is going is important, and we should learn it. And the astronauts were ready to learn and ready to contribute. And all of the people from the, the companies, different companies, were with us, with helping. So there were there were like four hundred and fifty thousand people in the U.S. doing little bits of things for this for the whole effort of the space effort, not just the Apollo program, but the space effort. Four hundred fifty thousand yeah. people. So there were all kinds of people that and minds that contributed to actually making this happen and yeah. making it happen well. You know, as a, you said space effort and there, it was a space race, right? And the U.S. was racing the Russians. Um, as somebody who was on the inside of that, on the inside of, in many ways, like the one of the Cold War fronts, how did it feel? Were, were you all talking about that competition uh, between the U.S. and the Russians on a constant basis, was this like on the bulletin board, beat the Russians? You better believe it. And the minds of every single one. Some guys, All 400,000 people were thinking the same thing. Everybody, everybody at once. And if they if they did not, so you, you reminded me, if we're working with something in, in Houston or doing this and that, and we said, well, I would have to rework that. You said, what do you mean you work? You don't have it now? No. So, so go do it and go do it now. And go it well. You, I, I, do you want the Ruskies to beat us? They call the Russians the Ruskies. You want the Ruskies to beat us, meaning everybody 
felt that he's got to do his work very well because yeah. he doesn't want to be the one person that's responsible for the for Russia to beat the US. <laughs> yeah. When you when you look back at that now, do you look at that with a specific sense of cynicism, nostalgia? Um like when like now it looks like we're entering a new Cold War, right? There is a new Cold War that we're being ushered into. Um and so I wonder when you look back at that period where there is this like larger purpose, do you think back to it with a sense of cynicism or a sense of um, relief or uh, how do you feel about that? No cynicism at all. I look at it with a sense of, of wonder and a sense of support because mm-hmm. it's uh, if, if you don't have an ability to think, okay, I'm going to compete and I compete well and prove myself, we'll never make it. I, if I did not have that stamina within me as a young man to do well and to do better than anybody else. I am I, I am an Egyptian. I have an accent. I, have, I don't know me. I can't pronounce my name. And therefore, I have to be 10 times better than any American geologist they can, can encounter or else. Why would they even look at me? So that was yeah. part of the deal. And it is still part of the deal. I've, I've got to everybody should be competing and everybody should work uh work hard to the to the tilt so that you can you can improve your improve the surroundings and do something better for humanity sure yeah i want to talk a little bit about um the, your relationship to the arab world at the time both your relationship to egypt but also your relationship to um uh, some of the, the states in the Gulf, which were newly formed in the 70s. Um, what do you remember about that period in your career, um, building those relationships? At the time, yeah. I had no idea. I was completely immersed in the Apollo program. I had no idea what the hell is happening anywhere in the Arab world or in the Gulf, or whether they knew about me or not, and most likely they did not know about me at all. And... Uh, it was actually after the Apollo program finished completely in 1972. In 1973, President Nixon, uh, after the uh, oil embargo that uh, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia started, uh, President, uh, President Nixon sent memos to all the different the, uh, departments within the US government saying we have a problem with the Arab world and uh, because they held back the gasoline and there was a real terrible gas mess in the gasoline mess in the US. And people were shooting each other to get some gasoline for their cars. And uh, so it was really crazy. And so the President Nixon sent to all of the departments to see if there were other two other things. Are there things that they, we can do to improve our relationship with the Arab world. One of these letters went to NASA. NASA administrator, who knew me well anyway, said, well, we can send them Farouk. He can talk to them about the space graph in Arabic, because he knows how to speak to them. So they did. The, the State Department arranged for a, a uh, tour, lecture tour for me, to go to Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Kuwait, Bahrain, go Qatar, all of the Gulf states, which is the, the producers of the gas, the gas, the producer of oil, members of the Arab uh, OPEC, and so I could talk to them about the results of the Apollo missions to the moon, and I did, and that was really my my introduction to the Arab world after Apollo. They had not heard about me much more. Some, some some clever guys had heard about me, but that was not known to the public. So, but when I did that, uh, they began to know about me. And and actually, in Egypt, I did not go to Egypt because Egypt was not involved in this group. And Mrs. Sadat told her husband, "This is Farouk al he's an Egyptian. He goes to all of these Arab countries in the Gulf, and he doesn't come to Egypt. Why don't you get him to here?" And his foreign minister 
told me that the president wants you to go, and I did. And this picture was one of those pictures in 1975. That's after the, the, the mission to the Gulf states. And I went to Egypt and I sat down and I learned about him. And he is the one that told me, uh, why don't you come and start something in Egypt? Some research project in your field in geology, start something in Egypt and go and anywhere, anywhere you wish. And when you have, you, when you encounter problems, I know you will encounter problems. Come to me, come to me personally, I will resolve them for you. So this was an invitation from the president of Egypt to go and start something. So I started a research project in the desert of Egypt with my alma mater, Ain Shams University. And that yeah. was my introduction to the study of the deserts of the world. Before we get to the study of the deserts of the world, which I, I do want to get to, wasn't there a moment during that diplomatic row where some uh, astronaut in space speaks Arabic? Yes. <laughs> yes. I, when I went to to, uh, to the Gulf to to uh, make my lectures, I, I I told them about the fact that I selected the landing sites on the moon and and based on what. And then I also gave them I, I gave a, a copy of the first surah of the Quran that was written in Arabic and in English, which was taken to the moon and returned to me and. I also gave, I had a recording of the greeting from Apollo 15 mission that was said by my friend, uh, astronaut uh, Alfred Warden, who said, Marhaban ahl al-ard min endeavor ilaykum salam. Who endeavor was the, uh, the name of his uh, spacecraft. And he said, hello, Earth. Greetings from endeavor. So I, I actually played that recording in Arabic in my lectures and showed them the copy of the Quran, the page of the Quran that went and and then I added some of the names of the great Arab and Muslim uh, uh, astronomers who who worked on the that were decorated by naming them on the surface of the moon and so on so Al Bayrouni Al Battani Al Batigni all kinds of fabulous Al Khwarizmi Arab scientists that have names on the moon because mm -hmm. they were recognized by by Western uh, scientists as, as great men. Okay, before we move on to the deserts, I just want to ask you, does it get old that you have been, when you get asked, do you, does it ever get old for you uh, when people ask you about your role in science pop culture? <laughs> you know, we have, for those who can't see the screen or are just listening, I have this image of uh, Star Trek there is the first, uh, you know, there's some shuttle. Vehicle, shuttle. Uh, shuttle that's named after you in the 1988 season. Did you sort of roll your eyes at this or were you sort no, of? No, 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 it was very nice. And actually, I know how it came about. It was, uh, I was making, I was making a film in NASA, NASA and the, uh, the, the, the film crew included a sound man. And the sound man actually became the executive producer of Star Trek The Next Generation. And he, while he was taking a picture of us, he said, Do you, uh, he asked me about all kinds of, of uh, creators on the moon. And I gave him my first book called The Moon as Viewed by Lunar Orbiter. And I gave him a copy of that and he loved it. And when he became the executive producer of this thing, he, he suggested to name this spacecraft after me. <laughs> so funny. It, it was nice, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about, about the desert. Um, people in the desert need water. Um, and um, it seems as though, uh, given what you just said, you are in some ways extremely, maybe uniquely qualified um, to help think through that challenge. So I have on the screen an article from the New York Times in 1993 that's describing a revelation that you came up with, a scientific discovery about a underground river in Kuwait. So help explain to me what your research has been for the last few decades um, as it concerns the, the water in Oman, Kuwait, UAE, and uh, the Arab world. Egypt also, yeah. Egypt. And, yeah. and some India and, and China, yeah. They're, they're all the deserts of the world. Actually, so all this came about when we finished with the Apollo program and I moved 
to the Air and Space Museum to start the Center for Earth and Planetary Studies in 1973. And during this year, the US and the Soviet Union made a deal to have something called the Apollo Soyuz mission. A, an American uh, uh, satellite goes upstairs to the, in space, and the Russian one, right? They get joined together, and they exchange what's there. Again, meaning the first international uh, mission to of of in space, joint U.S. and Russian mission called Apollo Soyuz. And uh, guys from NASA headquarters called me up. The man that uh, heads heads that mission called me up and he said, Farouk, and we need to add, add a photography for this mission. You're the one that taught all of the Apollo astronauts how to take pictures with the moon. Why don't you uh, work a program for, say, I have $250,000 to give you to start now and and finish until and work on it until we finish with the Apollo Soyuz mission. So make a program for it. And it happens that the Apollo Soyuz mission was going to fly close to the equator, not very far up and north, and closer to the equator are all the deserts of the world. So much of the things that the astronauts would fly over were deserts. And the one that I had started looking at was the desert in Egypt, because of the invitation of Dr. of President Sadat. So I started looking at the Arab deserts in general and making all of these Arab deserts in general, meaning being the first ones to, to for astronauts to take pictures, to make observations, to do all kinds of things over uh, the whole range of, of, the, of the whole unit of all of the Arab desert from Morocco all the way to, to Oman. And so we get lots of pictures and this kind of encouraged me to look at the deserts of the world and Australia and in China and in India, also in, in the Rajasthan in India, they invited me to look for potential dry water. So I became very linked to understanding how the deserts form and figured out that the desert formed in places that were not deserts in the past and they used to have water. And where is that water now? Where are the former rivers? Where are the such and such? So I began to look in with great detail at all of these pictures and we did, I developed then all of these notions, including the, uh, the discovery of the Kuwait River in and throughout the north part of North Africa, of, of the Arabian Peninsula. What are some of the geological or ecological issues in the region um, that you don't think people are talking enough about? Well, um, the desert itself, how the desert form, how it's set to say, how to, how, to, how to live nicely with the desert. <clears throat> so this is, this is something that we should all learn because the desert was not there as, as it is. The yeah. desert developed with time because of the climate change. <laughs> and the, what it's important that we now discuss the climate change of the earth mm -hmm. because the history of the earth is loaded with changes of climate throughout the history of the earth. So it is important to know how do we live with the changing environment of the earth. So it is, and, and the desert, and understanding the desert, how it formed, and what do you do with it now, is part of that. Because the desert can get us, can give us all kinds of things. And for instance, the desert in Egypt received, receives today solar radiation that is way beyond the solar radiation that goes anywhere in the world. The solar radiation the, it, it, it measure in, in, in this west, the, the desert west of the Nile is 200. That means the solar radiation that, rece that is get received in that area is capable of evaporating 200 times the amount of low frame fall. It's called an aridity index. By comparison, the aridity index of the driest place in North America, here in the US, called Death, Death Valley, because it's so terribly dry, the number for that is seven, meaning in our places are such more dry and so on, but they were not dry before. They were they had drain and there are all kinds of vegetation. Where is the drain and what happened to the vegetation is part of the stuff that we should learn and we're not learning. What, um, when you say that, uh, when you talk about before, are you talking about a hundred years, a thousand years or a million years? But maybe uh, the desert of Egypt became as dry as it is only 6,000 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Are there, are there signs of like increased desertification happening um, in the region now? 
Not really. No, it's not okay. in no, not in a vast uh, place, but uh, but <clears throat> lessening of uh, rainfall is happening, and w- where do we get the rainfall of the past is important, because yeah. there, if if you say that there was a Kuwait River, then you should think where this Kuwait River passed, and water beneath the pathway of that river would be saturated in the rock. And therefore, we can drill here and here and here and get water. <laughs> so it, it helps you d- this, uh, find the water of the past. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about your role as a as an advisor. Um, what are some of the major policy issues um, in Egypt and in the region and maybe uh, globally that you are most concerned with uh, these days? Supporting the youth of the world, but especially in the Arab world, in, in, and particularly in Egypt. I, <clears throat> I keep on telling everybody that during the Apollo program, the one thing that made it po- completely possible is the fact that the, all of the, act, the, the, the vast majority of the people working on Apollo were very young, just graduates from college because each and everyone has enough energy and they also, each and everyone wants to prove himself and they can sit on that problem and work on it as hard as they can and think about it and ask each other and fix it. That's not happening now. Very few people support the young people. I tell I tell people this, 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 the, the fact that during the Apollo mission to the moon in 1960, July 1969, Myself and three of the astronauts went through the uh, walkways in the Houston Center, the center that actually controls the mission completely. All the equipment in the mission and the astronauts and where they go and where they're not, when do you go to sleep and when are you not. And everything about the mission is controlled by the mission control center in Houston, Texas. And so we went through the corridors asking, taking the number of people that are working during the mission and their, their age, so that we can take an average, the average age of the people that were running Apollo 11 in real time was 26 years old. Amazing, wow. I, I say this in Egypt and the president tells me, yes, my we have, we, that's great. We have, we have now people that are being prepared to be ministers that, 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 that are for, only 45 years ago. I said, 45 years ago, he's beginning to think, what am I going to do when I retire? <laughs> I'm talking about in the 20s, because they have the knowledge, it's fresh in their minds, they have the energy, and they have not been been evaluated yet and they want to show that they are good they want to show that they are one to an engineering school and get a degree and i am good and so therefore i am going to work hard to show you that i am good and you, you need that you need that push from within without being without being said we wanted that to, to work the the mind to work and the energy of the mind to uh, uh, do the things that need to be done and do yeah. them very well because you don't want to be responsible for something bad happening that's the twenties. <laughs> are there any are there any promising signs in the region that you think are worth uh, noticing, uh, doubling down on? Is there anything that uh, only any in the UAE? Only in the UAE, and only because of Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid. I know him well. I worked with him a great deal, and uh, and I once when and that reminded me of what you said. I I once was telling him that. I'm delighted that you go and when you go to visit these uh, uh, government agencies, you talk to the younger generation. This is very good because he said that. He said, how did you see that? How do, how, how do you know that? You're in there. I said, I see your picture in the paper standing with a young kid with, and his desk is something, a mis- miserable looking small desk. He's not one of the big guys. He said, I'm, I'm glad you noticed that because I really think supporting the youth is the only thing that can make the country great. So I, he is a man that one that actually saw that and and worked at it. None of the other leaders have ever done any of that. Yeah. What do you think about the the space program? Well, the space program. In, yeah. In the U.S. No, in in the UAE. The ambition. That's their ambitions. It's, it's also run by very young people, men and women. 
for that matter, and it is that is great. That I, I really think that this is this proves my point that the UAE is emphasizing the youth and so on because uh, uh, Sheikh Mohammed also started the, the Sheikh Mohammed Center for Space Studies or something like that, and in Dubai, and yeah, they're yeah. all young people, and they're all doing, and they, and they were very heavily involved in the ML uh, satellite. So indeed, the UAE proved that it can uh, support young people and it can do something tangible. And they are sending people now to get degrees everywhere in the U.S. and in Russia and the and in the Europe to get degrees in the space science in general. Okay, let's move on to the quick questions, and then we'll have a few questions from the chat. Sure. Um, so first is, what are you reading or watching these days? Oh, I'm reading something about the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> oh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> I love history, so I'm, I'm getting I'm getting a lot of doses now in history. Yeah, Do you, I'm, also, I'm also working on my books. I have two books to to complete. One is Apollo and I about the whole story of Apollo and what went after that, and one about uh, the beginnings of ancient Egypt. Okay, interesting. The beginnings of ancient Egypt because the beginning of ancient Egypt was in the desert. Mm. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the desert origins of things Egyptian. Don't you? Didn't you work on something related to the shape of the pyramids? Yeah, and th this will be part of that. Yeah. Okay. What What was that? Uh, what was that about? What was the nature of that? Uh, that well, theory? They're just, they're just that the, they got uh, hints in the desert of shapes of rocks that persist, and that's yeah. how they build their their their. Their things, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Uh, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Not to walk with. Yeah, to spend a day with. Yeah, Mahatma Gandhi. He's gone to transfer, uh, but he, he, he was a man, a simple man who knew how to energize a whole nation by being true to himself, by being decent by being straightforward and not afraid. Yeah. Qualities that it seems as though you have tried to emulate. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? That it can be very easily obtained and, and you just hit the ground with a stick and find water or do this and that. And it is, it is, it is not as simple as that. It is very hard work. For long, for very long periods of time. Do do students? Uh, do you feel like there's a constant misconception from students who say, "Oh, I want to go into space. I want to go into space," but they have no idea. They don't really have a sense of the nature of the work. Yeah, but that's okay if they want. I mean, I think the the the, the wish to go to space is good. I said, I think even though even though they don't know what it, what it takes, but uh, it, if if you want to. Then you have to work at it. And because all of the people that went into space worked their butt yeah. off to get the knowledge and uh, acquire all the degrees that allowed them to do so. So it is not a, an easy path. It is very difficult. And you've got to be com 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 committed and work very hard to acquiring all the knowledge to be the, the only man or the only woman that can do the job for them. Yeah. Um, OK. Whose work do you admire or are inspired by? The works of the uh, actually the Arab poets of the past and uh, even the Iranian Omar Khayyam and people like that because these people that and the, the guy that like Al Khwarizmi and I named a creator after him on the moon because he developed the algorithm yeah the, the, it, when we call the word algorithm it is it is an actually a corruption of his own name algorithm. Al-Khwarizmi, al algorithm is Al-Khwarizmi. So he, they started with very little, but they worked very hard at it and developed all kinds of notions and ideas that, that are helping us to this day. Who does not know what an algorithm is? <laughs> at this point, <laughs> yeah. uh, algorithms know who we are. We don't need to know who yes. they are. <laughs> <laughs> the last question I want to ask you is um, going to be the last question in the whole Tijada series for each of our guests is, what do you think the future is for your industry and your trade? 
I think the future is great. I, th I think that we will learn a great deal more about the uh, all of the planets and what what how they they developed and what is their surface geology is like. And so this is developing very fast and will continue to develop. Do you do you roll your eyes at uh, figures like Elon Musk and SpaceX and uh, Jeff Bezos saying we need to uh, find planets and uh, send celebrities into space? I mean. Does that whole privatization sort of um, uh, encourage you or disgust you or somewhere in between? I'm delighted with all of that because it, it will result in better ideas, better inventions, better things that will help the governments in, in the future or people that are serious, not doing it for their own aggrandizement, but, but it will help us absolutely figure out our surroundings in space. Absolutely great. Do you ever worry that the um, that the sort of pol politicizing space um, or weaponizing space? Do you do you worry about oh, things like yes, that? Absolutely, absolutely. No weaponizing. We we made something within the United Nations that prohibits weaponizing uh, space. Meaning, no country is allowed to take something big to to hurt people in the ground or anything like at all. That's, there is a, a United Nations agreement. That is very important to keep that completely for knowledge and completely for for peaceful uh, use. No military action in space, period. Okay, great. Um, let's go to some questions. We have a few already. Um, Dana, if you want to ask your question. Uh, yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yep, yes. I got you. Um First of all, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to watch this uh, uh, interview with you. Um, I'm wondering, uh, how do you feel about the idea of colonizing other planets and colonizing space? I mean, don't you think that we should focus our efforts in um, trying to uh, live sustainably here on Earth and uh, achieve as humans, you know, achieve that goal of being able to live sustainably on our planet and preserving our planet and preserving the resources of our planet, rather than thinking about um, going to going other planets, else, putting yeah, so much, you them, know, yeah. putting, spending so much into um, finding resources elsewhere. Excellent um, question. Excellent question. And the, the answer is really, no, I don't, I don't think of these things as money down the drain. Because all of these people that spend that money and all of these people that have these notions, uh, they, the money is spent in research centers, universities, uh, acquiring knowledge. So whatever knowledge we gain is implemented and, and implemented in the society. So whatever is it that you need. For instance, the way I'm talking to you, the way you see me now could not have happened without the Apollo program. And the Apollo program was to look at the moon. So, and, and the fact that you can actually hear my, my voice, well, we had, we had AT&T working very hard on, on how do you communicate with an astronaut on the moon? And he's very far from us and, and not on Earth. So he's going to go beyond the atmosphere of the Earth. So how do you communicate? And that uh, AT&T actually made a... Seven year work on how do you make this communication work. And now it is, I can talk to you in Egypt or in Australia. Or so, immediate, immediate applications to the things that are done for space or for or whatever it is that benefits all of the people on Earth. Like, for instance, now you don't know, for instance, that all farmers in India, they now have a communication with their phone can the farmer in india can communicate with an indian satellite to get the picture of his own land at that time to see what how, how what is happening to his land right now whether it needs more water or less water or anything else that could not have been done any no government can actually do that for any for any farmer anywhere and governments anywhere everywhere don't really give a damn about farmers but here is a farmer that can communicate with, with the Indian satellite to get a picture of his own land to figure out what is, is this, his crop healthy? Does it require more water or not? And he can do it without 
interference from the government or from anybody else. So these are the applications that come from the developing the money to build an, 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 an India made it, uh, develop, spend the money to develop a satellite to take pictures of Amazing. Indian land. And okay, we have another question from UC. UC? Hi, um, hey. thanks so much for this. This has been so exciting. I've been smiling from ear to ear for the last hour like a nerd. <laughs> Um, and I have a kind of corny question, but I feel like because it's Ramadan, it feels right. Um, and I was wondering how, how or if Islam influenced your like perspective or career as a cosmic geologist? And um, if you ever had any desire to study the black stone at the Kaaba, or maybe you did, I don't know. I did. Okay. I did. did you find anything cool? <laughs> I visited there and I looked at it and, and I actually use this this visit to get a, a piece of moon rock that the astronauts could that uh, that that people that astronauts brought from the moon that people can touch at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington DC when I was working for the museum I told them we need we need to make a in the Apollo exhibit we will have to have a piece of rock that people touch they told me are you crazy yeah, they, 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 they will ruin it and they will come and tell me every few years you tell me give me another rock and that and you know these rocks are only for studies i said well there is one rock in that i saw and i touched said two million people touch it every year and has been touched from the, the seventh century and it's still there but, but touched by human hands and they agreed. They said they have just asked me the committee that would have been to say yes or no. They asked me, and how is it protected? I said yeah, there is only the protection of that black stone in Kaaba. It's one fierce-looking Bedouin with a sword. And the chairman of the group said, "Well, Farouk, if you can get us a, a fierce-looking Bedouin with a sword, we'll give you a piece of rock." <laughs> they agreed, and and it was at the Air Space Museum, and it's still there for people to touch so you can touch a piece of moon rock i like that the, i like the sample size is two million people per year for 1300 years <laughs> okay we have we have another question from donna who wants to follow up her question donna uh hi again <laughs> sorry hey. um well, basically, um, my issue is not with the scientific advancement. Um, I support it 100%, and I acknowledge the important contributions that have been made for our benefit. My issue is with the dominant wasteful attitudes and actions that affect those who are most vulnerable and who continue to fall into um, you know, a vicious cycle um, uh, and who probably, you know, they continue to be, their environments continue to be under threat, uh, their livelihood uh, continues to be un, um, under threat. And, you know, they may never, there's a portion of the population who would never be able to benefit from resources that are explored elsewhere in space. Um, and so my worry is that, you know, if we if we have this attitude that, you know, it doesn't matter if we utilize our resources on Earth, there's always other planets that we can um, take advantage of and uh, um, can harvest, if you want, for, for resources, then nothing will, you know, not much will happen to improve what's going on right now on Earth. I, I think my issue is this, this just general attitude of, of just continually, um, you know, taking advantage of resources, um, you know, irresponsibly. Let me, and, let, me, um, let me say that I, I actually agree with you, and but but I also say that there is absolutely no way that we think we can have resources from out there to that would help us. No way, with the resources of the earth is 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 what we have, and the resources out there is for potential use there if there is need. So I don't really think that anybody thinks now that we can use resources on the moon. For instance, we can, we have rocks on the moon that have like titanium. The basalt on the moon has a 11% titanium. And if the basalt on Earth has 4 to 7% titanium, it is a good ore. But on the moon, it's 11%. So you think that it would be good to go get basalt from the moon for the titanium. Uh, nobody ever thinks about that. So I don't really think that that it is seriously being thought about that we can use resources 
in outer space, the way out there, and no one, no one has proved or have have has shown us that it is possible anytime at all. Well, Dr. Albaz, thank you so much uh, for joining us, for sharing your time and your perspective with us. This conversation is going to go up online on YouTube and on our podcast tomorrow. So please share it with anyone you think would be interested. And it's really, really a pleasure to be able to learn from you and take so much time, so much of your time. Thank you. Good luck. And to, thanks to all your uh, those who came, joined us. Okay, everybody, take a, a nice day or evening, wherever you are, and we'll see you soon.